Indonesia time. Okay, uh, before we start the event, I would like to read a brief bio of our distinguished speaker. Uh, Professor Johannes M. Bauer is the Quello Chair for Media and Information Policy at Michigan State University. Trained as an engineer and social scientist, he holds doctoral degree in economics from the Vienna University of Economic and Business Austria. His research focuses on media and information policy, including topics such as network neutrality, causes of and solutions to digital inequalities, innovation in 5G wireless services, and generally the design of public interest technology. He uses qualitative and quantitative methods in his work, including computational approaches to policy analysis. His work has been funded by the US National Science Foundation and international organizations. Dr. Ba Bauer has served as an advisor to public and private sector organizations in North and South America, Europe, and Asia. He has held visiting professorships at the Delft University uh, from 2009, Netherlands, 2000, 2009, the University of Konstant, Germany, uh, 2010, and the University of Zurich, Switzerland, 2012. So the plan is Johannes will lecture for about 45 to 50 minutes, followed with QA. Uh, and without further ado, on behalf of Communication Postgraduate Program, Department of Communication, School of Social and Political Science, University of Indonesia, I welcome Professor Johannes M. Bauer. Johannes, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Vishnu, for this uh, kind introduction. And it's uh, good evening, everybody. It's a great pleasure to be with you. It's actually my first time in Indonesia, and I, I wish it were in person and not just on a on a computer screen. But nonetheless, it's a great pleasure to to be with you all. Uh, I was asked to talk about the digital economy, and I know this is an audience of of uh, mainly people who are interested uh, in in communications management issues. But to understand the digital economy, it's also necessary to veer a little bit into, into technology issues and economic issues. And I've tried to capture at an intuitive level, some of the key aspects that, that we need to understand to understand the digital economy. I also should say that I'm coming at this from a, from a probably an, uh, sort of a, a, a North American view now. I grew up in Austria, uh, but I've been living in the United States for a long time. And my European colleagues always tell me, you sound like an American. And so there's, there's probably an, an, an implicit bias. Um, but I've tried to, to explain and to put uh, issues into, the, into my presentation today that are probably generic. They're not just specific to any specific region. And I certainly do not have the knowledge nor the intention to, to tell Indonesia how, how to act in the digital economy. But although I hope that my, that my uh, presentation will help you uh, see better what the options are, what the potential challenges are, and how one can use the digital economy to the benefit of, of humans and to the benefit of society. And there are many, many opportunities. I'll, let me just now share my screen for a moment. Can you see it? Yes. Yes. Okay, let me also swap these two things. So I would like to make two points in my lecture. And I would like to share them right up front. One is that the digital economy has tremendous potential to improve the human condition. That's almost right, right? I mean, we all agree that that's the case, but you may not agree with the second point. I do not think this will happen automatically. Despite a lot of the discussions that we currently have. Secondly, to truly serve humanity, the digital economy will need guardrails, as I call them. It will need a framework of laws and regulations that align the tremendous forces of digitalization with the larger social good. And this is something that is very controversial among many people in the digital economy. 
but it is an important insight and I will come back to this at the end of my lecture. I'd like to present these topics to you in six steps. First, I'll briefly talk about what's the digital economy. Secondly, I will talk about the frameworks, the visions that we use to think about the digital economy, because the digital economy is full of uncertainty. In fact, nobody knows exactly where we will go, right? There are many, many visions, many, many imagine, uh, uh, images as to what could happen, and they shape the, the outlook that we have. And it's important to be aware of those uh, unless we, we misuse them. And then I will come more closely to issues related to, to the economics of the digital economy. We'll talk about platformization, one of the major trends, uh, the importance of platforms to organize the digital economy. Then talk more specifically about what we know about innovation and creativity in the digital economy. Look at the few selected economic approaches and business models uh, to the digital economy and then come back to this topic of, of guardrails. If you have any urgent questions along the way, please feel free to uh, put a message in the chat and uh, Rishnu will, will monitor and uh, he might, might uh, interrupt. If not, let's save the questions until the very end. So let's briefly reflect on what we mean by the digital economy. At some level, the digital economy is a misnomer. It's not a, it's not a good term. I wish we had another one. Um, because it's essentially the digitally enabled economy, right? Digital technology is what economists call a general purpose technology. That is, it is very flexible, it is very malleable, it can be adapted to many different uses, and it is increasingly, as we know, uh, pervading our, our, our private lives, our work lives, uh, and our, our, our civic lives. But I will nonetheless use the term uh, uh, throughout the presentation. So if you look at the digital economy then with this caveat, we see, we can look at sort of three concepts of it that are widely used. At the very core of the digital economy is, is what uh, is essentially a hardware, uh, software industries related to the running of networks uh, core information services used in management and, and telecommunications. But typically we use a broader concept uh, of, the, of the digital economy in the narrow sense that we add to this hardcore of the, of the digital economy, we add digital services and the platform economy. And then in, in an even no broader sense, when we talk about often the digitalized economy, we also include businesses that heavily rely on digital technology. So this would be e-commerce, e industry 4.0, precision agriculture, the algorithmic economy, often referred to as smart X, you know, smart something, smart agriculture, smart cities. Um, and then the sharing economy, the gig economy, the sort of overlapping between those two. Throughout this presentation, I will use the term digital economy in the sense of digitalized economy. Another misleading concept, I think, is very, very widespread, is this notion that data is the new oil. And I'm sure you have heard this. It's, it's, very, it's used very widely. It's another one of those misperceptions, right? Data is not the new oil. <laughs> Maybe it's better to, to say data is the new sunlight, uh, as some people have suggested, uh, for example, an article in The Economist. Or we could say data is the digital twin of the physical world, which is probably uh, even more appropriate. But it, the notion of data is the new oil is misleading in as far as it is not data that is important. It's the information and knowledge that is derived from data uh, that creates value for society. And it's most needed, but most, dis, uh, most difficult to attain is actually what's something on top uh, of knowledge even, and that's wisdom. And uh, it's very difficult to establish a link from data uh, to wisdom. There's other inputs are needed uh, that we have, but keep in mind that it's information and knowledge that are the key drivers of the economy, not, not necessarily data. Data is abundant and in fact, we have great difficulty to make sense of most of it. 
Now, with these preliminary caveats in mind, what do we know about the size of the digital economy? It's actually way smaller than we probably think, given all the talk about the digital economy. But in a narrow sense, just looking at the hardware, uh, networking, and so forth, and, and core services, it's it's about it's less than five percent of global GDP. This data is from 2019, so that's the most recent one I could find. It's in the broader sense, if we include all those uh, heavily digitally enabled services and businesses, it's currently about 16 percent, a little less than 16 percent of global GDP. Now it's higher in the U.S. and uh, and in China, the two countries for which I have specific data. Uh, 6.9 and 21.6 percent for the U.S. and then 6 and 30 percent um, for China. Nonetheless, everything else that is happening in the economy is, in some way, uh, indirectly enabled by by digital technology, and that's why I emphasize this digitally enabled economy is an alternative. You're also interested in, in creative industries, right? and, and, and here we have another term that is relatively fuzzy. Right? At some level, I'm inclined to say that all digital industries are creative. Right? The, the, the importance of, of innovation, of novel thinking is very, very high. Digital technology, because it's so flexible, invites new thinking and invites new solutions to existing problems. But if we want to focus more specifically on what we mean by creative industries. You could think about music, performing arts, film, TV, radio, video games, of course, are a very fast and very large industry. Uh, things such as IT, software, computer services, publishing, and so forth. Uh, and then related to those more broadly speaking, perhaps uh, tourism, sports, heritage industries, and so forth. All these, of course, are also transformed by digital technology and digitalization, and will come later on to the implications of changes in the organization of the digital e economy on those creative industries too. It's also important to keep in mind that the technological capabilities that we have are, are, are expanding rapidly. And many of the key technology developments that we will expect that will affect us or already have started to affect us uh, new, new connectivity technologies such as 5G, 6G, the Internet of Things. People will now speak about the Internet of Intelligence as the next stage of the Internet of Things. Uh, that would be kind of advanced networking, uh, smart devices combined with artificial intelligence. We have new computing architectures. Uh, there's, an, in, in fact, a continuous movement uh, of data from centralized locations such in the, in the cloud uh, to edge locations uh, or even for computing on individual devices. So it's a mix of different computing architectures that is important. Big data analytics, robotics, uh, blockchain, and so forth. And again, we'll see what the implications of these technologies are. These technologies all currently follow exponential performance improvements. And this has an unbelievable fascination on human beings. Actually, we live, we are more comfortable in a linear world, right? For, for, for tens of thousands of years of our history, we've lived in very static conditions where very little changed. And for the last 200 years, things have changed uh, exponentially. And we're fascinated by it, but we're, we can't really well explain it. Uh, and I'll, I'll come back to this in, in a moment. Uh, but what it means is that technical performance increases that is epitomized in things such as Moore's law or Cooper's law, which is, is a law of wireless communications, meaning uh, that we can double the amount of data, for example, that we can send through any wireless channel in the same cycle as Moore's law, about a year and a half. Um, these performance increases imply that the cost of information processing is, is decreasing rapidly. And if the cost is rapidly decreasing, that means we'll use these technologies more. And finally, in this section, let me just mention and I'm, I'm sure you already talked in your course about this, or maybe you will talk about uh, digital inequality, but, but the, the digital economy is globally highly concentrated and there are many, many inequalities. And uh, let me just mention two of them. This is again from an anchor from the Digital Economy Report 2019. 
the two dominant countries uh, in, 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 in those industries currently are the United States and China. The, the US, for example, holds 75% uh, of all the intellectual property to, related to blockchain technologies. Half of the global spending uh, on, on, on the Internet of Things and 75% of the cloud computing market. Together, the US and China actually have essentially 90% of the capitalization of the, of, the, of the world's largest, 70 largest dig digital platforms. If you look at the top 25, you'll see that uh, uh, they are essentially from the US and from China, there's maybe one or two European ones in between, but, but it's a very unequal distribution. And then there's enormous digital divides. Um, th this data is, is, is you know, from 2019 again, now there's less than 50% of the, of the world remains offline, but it's still 56% or so of the world, 46% uh, of the world population. This is particularly egregious in, in uh, the least developed countries that have very poor income. Fortunately, this is Indonesia is, 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 is way above that group. And the gender gap is also very high. Uh, and, and this related uh, uh, is larger in, in countries with lower income generally. And these inequalities are a huge challenge actually to utilize the benefits of the digital economy. And one of the big challenges is how to avoid that those benefits actually increase inequality rather than reduce uh, inequality. So that was the first part, a brief snapshot of uh, the digital economy. Now, let me say a few things briefly about, about the imaginaries, metaphors, and frameworks. As I said before, we face relatively high uncertainty as to where the digital transformations will take us. And as, as human beings, when, when we face such deep uncertainty, where there's multiple developments that are possible, right? we, could, we could see a, a future of, of great benefits for all, but we have in the last five, 10 years also seen more and more books that have very dystopian outlooks uh, of authoritarian states controlling individuals uh, and so forth. Right? I'm, I'm not sure you're, you're probably too young to, uh, to have seen the movie, The Matrix, right? but that's kind of one of those early dystopian outlooks as to what, uh, how, how a digital world could look like. That there's a very rich literature in, in communications and in other disciplines on imaginaries. They have they are important, right? Because we essentially use imaginaries to fill the gaps of things that we don't know. The problem is when we forget that these are only images and visions rather than realities, right? And and the tendency is that these imaginaries, which are frequently defined, for example, by Charles Taylor at the at the University of Chicago as a common understanding that makes possible common practices and a widely shared sense of legitimacy, or as collectively held and performed visions of desirable futures. So there are sort of collective visions and we, re we act on those visions and we shape our own futures based on those visions, not, not based on reality, but based on reality. So they become performative as social scientists say. Now there's numerous imaginaries related to the digital economy. The oldest one probably is cyber utopianism. So the early designers of the internet in the 1960s, for example, thought of cyberspace as a new frontier, a new frontier where the physical world principles don't apply, right? The government has no role. Uh, there's a very legendary uh, declaration of the independence of cyberspace that came out uh, you know, 35 years later. Uh, but it's it's a very powerful image that, that that cyberspace is not related to our physical world, and we do know now it is wrong. Right? Nonetheless, there's there's many many people in the community who still adhere to this notion, and it has sort of a kernel of truth. It's not completely wrong, but it's also not completely right. The other very captivating vision is transhumanism that that there will be a singularity, a most a widely uh, Share is this view by, is by Ray Kurzweil, who's currently working for, for Google, uh, essentially the convergence of humans uh, and, and machines. And finally, let me just mention the, the, the fascination with exponential growth. How many curves have you seen of exponential data growth, of exponential 
you know, growth in knowledge generated and so forth. And, and these, these curves don't really tell us very much uh, about, about, uh, about our reality, right? If I, if, I put, if I capture an image in a thousand pixels um, and then I capture it in a million pixels, I have increased data flow by a fact of thousand, right? But essentially, I have just shown maybe the same picture, maybe at a higher quality. But there's, we have to really uh, remain very critical about those ex exponential growth trends. And then we see, of course, warnings of authoritarian and dystopian futures: uh, digital colonialism, surveillance capitalism, are terms uh, that are used. They're all potential outlooks, but the question is, how do they relate to what we know about the digital economy? And so. I want to emphasize conceptual lenses. These are sort of more research approaches. And some of those are discussed in, in the background readings uh, that you have for this course. And let me start with the, uh, on the, on the, on the left-hand side with political economy approaches. And they are very good in emphasizing and recognizing that in the digital economy, there is power, there is class structures, there is exploitation of some parts of the participants in that economy. You know, uh, we, in, in some, at some level, right, we are all expropriated because our data are appropriate by companies uh, who offer them free digital services. Uh, the concerns here is digital colonialism, digital uh, surveillance, uh, uh, and we have very, very inspiring thinking in Marxist and neo-Marxist approaches. On the other hand, on the, on the very right-hand side of this slide, you see what is called or often referred to as mainstream economic approaches. And, and here, the emphasis is actually more more instrumental, right? We we recognize the role of digitalization in supporting one of the key problems of human society. That is, how do we coordinate between people who do different things? Uh, how do we sort of coordinate between people who specialize in manufacturing clothes, in producing uh, food, in um, in developing software code, and so forth? And these approaches emphasize that digitalization reduces the cost of coordination. Uh, economists use the term transaction costs and search costs uh, to, to more specifically refer to, to those. And this increases the efficiency of, of the way we can run our economic and social processes. It allows a higher degree of specialization. And as, as a result, it accelerates and boosts economic growth and, and income. Uh, on a per capita and on a national basis. You will see that a lot of the current thinking on the digital economy is actually inspired uh, um, by, 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 this framework, uh, by this framework. And then in between, we have, we have uh, a group that is deliberately positioned in between, uh, that I refer to as institutional behavioral economics, where we also emphasize the importance of power, but the, the need and importance of appropriate institutional arrangements, such as laws, regulations, um, codes of, of conduct and so forth to govern these interactions. So there is, there is, there is a recognition of the, of the correct analysis of mainstream economics. There's also a recognition of some of the themes articulated in political e economics, but it is, it is uh, integrated into a very uh, a positive view as to how much action we have and how much agency we have to influence the technologies in ways that benefit us. Uh, so I'm sure you have been inundated uh, in, 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 in the news and uh, in, in, in daily life with uh, images of the digital transformation. And it's one of those imaginaries, but it's not completely wrong, uh, but it's also not completely right. And there's five domains in businesses that really are affected by um, such digital transformations. It's, it's how, how businesses relate to consumers. Um, it's the intensity of competition. It's the role and importance of data in those, in those transactions. And of course, uh, the knowledge and the insights that we generate from this data. Uh, the pace of innovation is accelerating in, 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 in digital economies and value creation changes, right? Uh, there are tremendous opportunities for new businesses to utilize uh, uh, the powers of digital technology and to really build innovative new business models in, in those five dimensions. And I listed uh, a few of the Indonesian unicorns uh, from, from, the, um, from, the, 
from a consulting report from a company in uh, in, in Jakarta, and um, and it's fascinating to see that that uh, that uh, Indonesia could uh, could create uh, quite a number of, of those unicorns, and there's others uh, a little bit smaller in size. Again, you know, because of this fascination with exponential growth, we love unicorns. <laughs> nothing magic about about that valuation, and actually. Frequently, there's nothing tangible behind the valuation, but we, we, we are fascinated with unicorns. Um, and lastly, a warning, what we see is that in, in these processes of digital transformation, and I, I really will not have the time to go into this in more detail, we see that many, many companies face a digitalization paradox in that they, uh, they, they invest a lot in digitalization, but they cannot achieve their revenue gain. In fact, uh, it's one of those riddles, right? We haven't fully uh, learned how to handle digital technology. The second uh, dimension where we talk about digital transformation are societal approaches. So people, uh, policymakers, managers uh, talk about uh, the benefits of productivity increases, the benefits of new and higher paying jobs. Um, so there's numerous examples, including in Indonesia, for example, where lots of uh, innovative uh, individuals, groups, were able to get into digital design industries or into digital animation. And relative to the prevailing wages, we're able to achieve higher income. We see a broadening of the workforce participation in the gig economy, but with many downsides too, right? Such as a, a very fragile uh, safety net for, for these participants in, in many countries. Uh, new opportunities for financial inclusion, for example, the biggest, uh, the biggest uh, success story here is M-Pesa in Africa, where, where, where there was just no banking infrastructure, but also in, in, in Southeast Asia, right, where, where until recently half the population had no access to, to uh, financial bank accounts, for example, where fintech services, branchless banking and so forth really has helped. Uh, enabled the financial transactions of, of a large part of the population. Better government, better services, contributions to the uh, sustainable development goals and so forth. And we also see that worldwide actually COVID has acted as a, as a digital transformation accelerator, one could say, right? It has really sort of uh, uh, pushed us down the curve. And so here's an example of, of what sort of some of the estimated benefits are. Keep in mind, these are all imaginaries, right? These are, these are sort of our best guess estimates. And there's a lot of imagination involved here, but this is from McKinsey uh, and from, a, from an uh, Accenture uh, report. And it, it sort of anticipates a, a considerable contribution of one part of the digital economy, the internet of things uh, to the world economy. And, um, so the, the 11.1 trillion US dollars per year in 2025, which is the upper boundary, that's a significant part of global GDP. It's about 12, 13% of global, of the global economy. And the biggest chunks um, of these contributions are sort of in, in manufacturing, in, in cities such as public health and transportation, uh, in retail environments and also in human health, as well as in logistics, right? And um, now the interesting thing of what we know about these developments is that, that there's an enormous potential to improve efficiencies, right? That's one of the strengths of the digital economy. Um, we know that sort of the effects are probably more pronounced in B2P environments uh, uh, so business to business rather than on consumers. But we also know that the effects are probably much larger in lower income countries. So low middle, lower middle income countries will be those uh, that, uh, that within or middle income countries that would include uh, Indonesia are those that benefit way more from others because there's simply more inefficiencies in the current structures that can be addressed. So these are the imaginaries that captivate our, 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 our images. So let's, let's now move on and look more specifically at some of the, 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 the structures that we see in the digital economy and then in innovation. So maybe I should ask us, are there any, we should have any immediate questions? Uh, not really. I will, I will 
I will ask after your. Yeah, yeah that's that's okay. I was just you know if if I have lost oh, everybody, no. then I, then I'll I'll slow down. Or, or okay. Yeah. I'll go back. So let's briefly talk at, at platformization, uh, which is one of the the key trends uh, in, in in the digital economy. And it's 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 a, it's an often misunderstood uh, development. And it's important to understand to really grasp what we mean by platformization. So many people currently speak about the digital economy as an ecosystem. And again, it's one of those, those metaphors that has as many strengths, right? It is true. There are many players, they're interdependent, um, they're interrelated. The actions of one player typically influence the actions of others. So that's that's these are all things that we see in, in, in natural ecosystems too. But then there's also this disadvantages of using the ecosystem notion because many people also say, well, in ecosystems, there is no market power. Nobody can control the ecosystem. It's, it's self-organizing. And that is actually misleading, right? Uh, even in ecosystems, there are sort of very powerful species uh, called keystone species biologists. So, so one has to be careful with that notion, but it's widely used. And so here you see the, the panoply of players uh, that, that uh, populate this digital ecosystem. One of the key aspects is that value generation in this digital ecosystem often requires that players in different parts collaborate. And so I've distinguished four parts, but you could look at others. Uh, for example, we need services from physical networks. We need logical development platforms such as operating systems, let's like say um, Android, for example, or iOS to develop services. Uh, of course, content and application and creative industries are extremely important. And we need, of course, devices that are capable uh, to, to handle those things. Now, what we, you see here already uh, is that some players, for example, Google is one of them, are present across all these layers, right? And those players, of course, they have a much stronger position than others. Other players may only be uh, available or capable to produce content services. and they are much more dependent on players on those other layers. Platforms essentially is the institutional mechanism to, to achieve this coordination that we talked about, right? So platforms essentially are systems that include uh, a shared infrastructure, typically an OIP network uh, that uh, could be the public internet, but it could also be a private a more close network, a, a software platform that enables different types of applications and then users who use those applications. So in that sense that that ecosystem uh, metaphor is very good. Typically, we also see more than one platform competing against each other. So there's more than one search engine, there's more than one uh, social media company, there's more than one, um, let's say, um, ride sharing company. But given sort of some of the economic features of the digital economy, there's typically only few, which is one big difference in the digital economy. So platforms really enable the value creation between external producers and consumers. They organize these other stakeholders. They organize app providers. They organize uh, software designers. They organize device manufacturers. And so therefore platforms have become a very critical coordination tool in our in our digital economies, right? And that's that's a that's a function that is frequently overlooked. We we see the power, we see the the desire to appropriate uh, appropriate data uh, of our private lives, but we don't see the coordination function. Now, platforms, of course, come in many shapes and many forms, and and some uh, are more coordination platforms. So let's say, GoCheck or, or Uber. Uh, others uh, may organize more social spaces like Facebook, for example, where you have, of course, e-commerce portals and so forth. But uh, they all, in some way or another, enable direct interactions between two or more different types of part, uh, partners who otherwise could not interact or would have a hard time finding each other. So platforms really enable uh, transactions between decentralized parties and they facilitate innovation greatly. And you know, some, some of the platforms actually um, 
go way back, right? I mean, so the platforms are not necessarily an invention of, of the digital economy. You could say that in some sense, newspapers were platforms. Uh, they bring together advertisers, right? They bring together readers, uh, information seekers and information offerers. They, they bring together businesses who want to sell things. Uh, so the idea of platform is not entirely new, but digital technology has greatly amplified what we can do it. And the next generations of technologies, right? Uh, ubiquitous broadband connectivity, ubiquitous computing, uh, the integration of geolocation and, and data services and so forth. Uh, of, of online payment services, of reputation mechanisms, and so forth, analytics and algorithmic decision making will all improve the types of innovations that we can uh, can uh, carry out in platforms. It's also important to see that platforms have very very unique economic characteristics, and and and. Um, and um, let me just mention a few. This is a very complicated topic, and we could spend a lot of time getting into. I want to give you sort of an intuitive understanding, but right? the, the two that I would like to mention is that first of all, platforms have network effects, uh, externalities and complementarities. These are all related. Essentially, a direct network effect means that um, the usefulness of a service is dependent on the, on the number of, of total users, right? So for example, if you are uh, a mobile phone user, and there's only one other mobile phone user, well, there's two of you, right? The network has maybe some value if it's your favorite friend, um, but it may be of limited value if it's somebody who you don't know, right? So, so having multiple, many more people on that network is a direct uh, benefit. And we see the same thing in social media, uh, the larger your graph, perhaps the more uh, on Facebook, the, the more benefits you have. Even if you interact only with a small group on a regular basis. Secondly, there's very strong indirect network effects and they're probably more important than the, or as important as the direct ones. And indirect network effects means that if there is a large group of users, we have more complementary services. We have more software, we have more devices, um, we have more, more, more uh, add-ons and, and the value of the whole ecosystem grows. So these two effects really are sort of positive uh, feedback loops if you wish. And many of those effects percolate uh, through the whole system. Economists use the term spillover effects or externalities, uh, sometimes public good effects. So, so it's difficult for an individual to capture those network effects. If you have one user of, of, in the phone network, right? I mean, there's a lot of benefits that your presence has for others, but you do not necessarily think about those when you, when you make a decision whether you join the phone network or a social medium. Uh, or not. So these are sort of uh, advantages of, of, of being large. And this ties into the unique cost structure of, of digital uh, economy services. And many of those services actually require a very, very high upfront cost, but then providing one unit of service is very, very cheap. So for example, building a search database, uh, building a search engine requires an enormous amount of money to build that infrastructure, to organize the data, but then running one search essentially is free. Doesn't cost anything. So, so we have businesses that have very, very high fixed cost or sunk cost that need to be expended before you can run your business, but very, very low unit costs. And, uh, and uh, people often talk about the zero incremental or the zero marginal cost society, right? But, and uh, it's, it's extremely difficult in situations like this to, to create a sustainable business models. And so when we in a few minutes talk about business models, we'll see how one of the big challenges in this environment is how do you appropriate sufficient revenue to make your business sustainable? So together, uh, these, these effects really create what is called winner takes all dynamics. So we see on the one hand, uh, uh, the, the network effects mean that, uh, that the more users you have, you know, the more value you generate uh, and, and therefore the more um, revenues you can, you can appropriate. And then the, the cost effect means that the, the larger your, your service is, the lower the unit costs here expressed in, in dollars. And so of course, the, the dynamics of markets means that companies will grow to the largest possible amount. And that's why we, in most digital markets, we see very few dominant players. 
And it's like a built-in economic force to more concentration. Um, some people talk about this as, as superstar effects, but it's, you know, it's, which is true sort of in entertainment, for example, or in sports, right? Uh, where the, where the, the top, or in the academy, where the top stars get command the highest pay and so forth. But this is very different from the industrial economy, because in the industrial economy, the cost structure and the revenue structure worked exactly in the opposite way. The industrial economy was limited by increasing incremental cost and decreasing value. Here we have uh, a built-in mechanism toward abundance, but also to market concentration. This is one of the big challenges. So now we're uh, through three major segments. Let's now move quickly and briefly look at what, uh, how innovation unfolds in this economy. Again, I want to just say a few things about innovation, right? So you probably all have a sense of what innovation means when, when we talk about innovation. And um, you know, the, the most generic uh, definition is actually from a communications call, one of the most widely cited uh, uh, pieces of research in communications by Ev Rogers, who at some point actually taught at, at the same college that I'm at, at Michigan State University and he's passed away now. But he said, innovation is an idea, a practice or an object that is perceived as new by an individual. Um, novelty that contributes to sustainable efficiency increases is another definition by, let's say by uh, Cristiano Antonelli in Italy, uh, or also used by the OECD, the most widely cited Oslo manual, which is, a, is, a, is an instruction manual, how to measure innovation. Typically we think about innovation as a new process, a new product, a new good, a new service. So you could you could think about uh, GoCheck, for example, that does uh, organize a local transportation differently as a new production process, or you could think of of, uh, of uh, a Facebook uh, or a social medium as a new services service, for example. There could be new marketing methods, and I'll show you a couple just in a moment. New organizational methods, uh, new designs, new product aesthetics. The problem with this definition is that it really does not capture the essence of innovation. Right? It's, 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 it's just the outcome of innovation, but really not what innovation is. And so most recently in the last 10 years or so, especially in the digital economy, because innovation is so fast, we think of innovation more as a dynamic process, as a, as a process, a continuous cycle in which experimentation, real-time feedback, selection, and replication work in a continuous loop. And so for example, a company like Amazon will regularly vary the way it shows its products to its customers. And then it will measure, do like A-B testing, measure the differences, how the different types of displays, how the different prices affect consumer choices, and then will optimize its, 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 uh, 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 its business strategy based on it. So it creates real-time feedback. It picks the model that works, and then it replicates those things that work. That's very unique for the digital economy. Um, from, an, from a business or, or an economic perspective, there's really three Johannes, you're muted. We cannot hear your voice. Johannes? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Can you hear okay. me again? Yes, yes, thank you. Uh, okay, all right, okay. I'm not sure how, uh, let me go back to my sharing mode here. Okay, all right. So, so there's three factors uh, that, that drive innovation. And uh, again, this is, uh, this is management uh, and, and, and uh, economic thinking, but you'll see in a moment how they relate uh, to, to the opportunities of, of creative industries. One is, is the degree of competition. And competition, uh, you know, there's, there's various ways we can measure it. But for example, how many how many companies are in the field? Uh, how many rivals do you have as a business? How how easy is it, is it for others to imitate? So, for example, I talked before about uh, about um, companies that offer digital design services and digital animation services. And um, in some of those areas, it's actually all you need is a good idea. 
and, uh, and a little skill to do so. But that means that the barriers to entry, the barriers to imitate what you're doing are very low. Before you know it, somebody else will have the same idea, right? And so this, this business may not be uh, as innovative for a long time. It may be easy for others to replicate what you're doing and then your opportunities to, to, uh, to succeed and have a sustainable model will shrink. So both too much competition and too little competition actually is negative for innovation. So innovation thrives in a, in a, in a sweet spot of, of uh, just the right amount of workable competition. The second question is, what, what are the appropriability conditions? Appropriability sounds very complicated, but it essentially means, can I monetize my, my digital idea? Can I can create a revenue stream that is sustainable and sufficient to cover the, the resources that I need? Um, and this is actually one of the biggest challenges currently in, in the digital economy. So for example, if you think about news, uh, content producers deriving a sustainable revenue stream to support uh, news gathering and news analysis and so forth has become a major, major challenge for businesses. And it has to do with the, the larger ecosystem of the economy. And we'll, we'll see more details in a moment. And lastly, innovation depends on, on the opportunities that are available. This could be technical opportunities, it could be you know, business opportunities, uh, new business models. So this, this notion of an ecosystem where you organize kind of a, a whole uh, group of, of associate producers and consumers is one, but this could also be regulatory. And one could say that the success story of, and I know more about uh, Uber and Lyft, uh, for example, because I studied those in, in the US market but the success story of, about these local transportation services is in part a story about really misplaced regulation of existing taxi services. So they're essentially committing what is called regulatory arbitrage. So it's poor government that, they, that gives them an, an innovation opportunity. Of course, the benefits accrue nonetheless. So, so competition, appropriability, opportunities. Together, this will influence the rate and direction of innovation. Uh, competition typically will stimulate innovation, except if it's too low or too high. Um, in order to innovate, we need to be able to monetize. If we can't monetize our ideas, at least in the commercial environment, we will, we will shy away from, from taking the risk of innovation. And then of course, innovation will depend on the opportunities that we have. Okay. And of course, you know, there's feedbacks from, from, from uh, that I, um, in the interest of time, will not talk about. Now you probably have heard a lot about, about disruption. And right? I mean, it's another one of those metaphors that people in the digital economy love. If you think about it, what's desirable about this disruption, right? There's very little that's actually desirable about disruption. Uh, maybe it's desirable to disrupt some really inefficient solution, but nonetheless, the idea of disruption has become uh, glorified. And it's actually, it's based on a book by Clayton Christensen, a uh, book called The Innovator's Dilemma. That book has been criticized by, for being based on really very selective uh, and weak evidence. Um, but it raises actually a good idea nonetheless, right? And, and the idea is that it can, can be that if technology moves very quickly, that successful firms actually might fail by keeping um, their path by doing what they are doing well, by Im improving their services, they may nonetheless be undermined by other businesses, right? I mean, so what they're doing actually, what they're doing well now destroys their own future. If disruption happens like this, it's actually, it's to some degree tragic, but it's happening in the digital economy all the time. What is not true though, is this statement in the middle by Mark and Reason, who's a very, fantastic entrepreneur, right? Mark Andreessen was, was the co-author of Mosaic. Uh, again, you, you may be too young to remember, but Mosaic was the first browser, first web browser in 1993. It really launched the, the web. Uh, and later he co-founded Netscape. Now he funds a lot of Silicon Valley companies. But he said to be against disruption is to be against consumer choice, against more people being served and against shrinking inequality. Now, 
this is again at the level of, of myth, right? When this, these, these statements have very little evidence, uh, but disruption has become a, 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 something that many people think is desirable. And I think we have to rethink uh, that. Let me just skip this one. And um, this slide, I just wanted to say that there's different types of innovation that coexist. Let's now um, spend the remaining uh, uh, time to talk about uh, briefly the, the, the different business models and then the guardrails. Let's look at a couple of uh, business models quickly, just to give you a sense as to how creative industries could now survive in this economy. Let me say, first say something about sustainability because uh, independently of, of what your business model is, whether it's a capitalized capitalist for-profit enterprise or whether it's a non-profit enterprise or whether it's a, a communitarian enterprise, you have to generate resources that are sufficient to, to uh, pay for your expenses, right? And this could be from sales revenues, from membership contributions, from donations, from venture capital funding and so forth. Uh, and so in the digital economies, we see actually a vast range of, of business models. Some of them are very similar to the non-digital economy, direct sales, for example, Amazon sells goods online. Um, we see Netflix essentially as a retailer of, of, of online uh, um, videos. We see commissions and fees. Uh, uh, I'll show you in a moment the example of Super Rare or Amazon Market uh, Place or, or Gojek uh, uses a similar model. We see three-way markets such as let's say news or Google search where you, you sell content, but you make money from a related market for advertising. Uh, the model of freemium as it is referred to where for example, Spotify, where you have a offer a free tier free, you know, uh, that is advertising financed, actually not completely free, you're paying data uh, and a for pay tier. Or it could be based on the gift economy, uh, voluntary contributions, uh, let's say some of the arts markets, for example, Patreon is, is one where you just donate uh, an amount of your own choice to an artist of your liking. And so let, let's just look at those. And so what you should recognize can I see is, is that the, the model of digital platforms that I showed you before, uh, where you have the platform a little bit simplified here that also includes the, the logical uh, software layer and then the related players. And I'm not sure whether you've heard of Super Rare. Uh, it, it, it has created a lot of waves. It's a, it's a young startup company. It's actually uses an auction model to, to sell digital art. It is based on blockchain technology. Uh, and Ethereum uh, uh, uses Ether as a as a as as a, as a payment, and um, and essentially artists who sign up for that network create unique um, tokenized uh, crypto collectible digital art, and that art can be owned and traded using a new digital tool called an NFT or a non fungible token. Right, that non fungible token essentially shows that you are the owner of that, of that piece of art and you can then display it in whatever version you like and so forth. And so the money, the, the auction platform makes money by getting a, a commission from the buyer. That's 15% of the total um, purchase price, uh, uh, a commission from the artist, 3%, and then 85% of the, of the, uh, of the uh, sales price goes to the artist minus the 3% to the platform, right? So, so everybody kind of gets a share uh, in these transactions. And clearly you see that these network effects that I said argued before, right? <coughs> the more artists there are, the more buyers will be attracted to join that platform. The more buyers there are, the more artists will be interested in being on the platform, right? Uh, the more art buyers there are, this is now a single side network effect, the more a direct network effect, if you wish, and not an indirect one, the, the more buyers there are, the more buyers would like to join because now they have a buyer community uh, and so forth, right? You see all these positive feedback loops and you see a model uh, that, that, that assures sustainability by splitting the transactions uh, between the participants. The, 
the prices for some artwork, they are fantastic and exorbitant, right? I mean, the, the, the most expensive digital art piece uh, was actually not sold on, on Super Rare, uh, but the artist is on Super Rare. It was by uh, people, people, uh, the 5,000 days, uh, everything, uh, uh, digital, digital collage, which sold for $63 million actually at, at, at an art auction. So, so the amount of money that's generated here is, is, is fantastic. And there's also, of course, many, many that go for very little. Another model out here would be Spotify's business model. Now this is more complicated, but you see the same sort of ecosystem notion here, right? You have the platform, uh, music platforms, like for example, Spotify. And then you have, you have this, you see this freemium model, as I said before, where on the one hand, you have a free user tier. Uh, so free essentially is not, is free of payment, but you actually, you pay with your data. Uh, so the free user gets music, pays with data, but the platform can actually make it available, can create audiences based on different characteristics and sell it to advertisers uh, or, or other businesses who want to, uh, want to post ads uh, in, in, the, in the stream, right? And so Spotify in this group makes money by selling ads to advertisers. Same things, there's positive network effects. The more free users there are, the more interested advertisers are to be on the platform. Uh, the more advertisers there are, the more Spotify is, 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 is interested in, in, in recruiting and then making music available. But there's also in this particular case, there is a, another group of paying subscribers, right? The pay subscribers pay money for music, get services, uh, and it's a, it's a classical transaction, right? Advertise uh, music, or, or Spotify in this particular case also has a challenge because it has to compensate uh, artists and labels for the music, right? And the biggest expense that Spotify faces is actually royalties that it has to pay. And as a result, actually that, that model so far has not been profitable, right? Spotify has only lost money since its existence. Uh, last year, they lost 580 uh, million euros, I think um, it was. And so here you see kind of the split between those two groups. You see that, that uh, currently uh, the largest number of, of users is actually in the premium paid category. And if small uh, revenue shares generated by ad support revenues, but in terms of the, the number of, sub, of users, it splits almost uh, evenly. There's about 43, um, Yes, yeah, so there's, there's about $155 million. Um, so uh, 20, 155 million subscribers, about 44% of the total are in the, in, the, in the premium group, but they generate uh, the, the vast amount of revenue. And then the other 56% of use is in the ad, advertising support tier and they ge generate very little uh, total revenue. So that's, that's now a hybrid business model. You combine uh, if, if a free model with a premium model, essentially. It's all very simplified. And now we need to wrap up. I'll be, I'll be done just in a couple of minutes. So now this, now we're getting to the more complicated one, right? Now you have uh, somebody like Google. And, uh, and this, is, this is extremely simplified. I mean, the others were simplified, but this is extremely simplified. Uh, Google now is different from the others in that it sort of, it runs actually a complementary system of platforms, right? I mean, you have, you have uh, Google search, you have YouTube, for just to mention mention a couple. You have you have the Android operating system as a logical development platform for mobile uh, services and so forth. And and let's look at those sort of separately, right? The the traditional search market is is a, is a classical three way market, right? So you have information seekers on the one hand who get information for free. Although they like in the Spotify case, they're free to they pay, you know, uh, by making uh, data about the online uh, browsing habits available to Google, which Google then uses and sells to advertisers. But it's essentially a three-way market, right? I mean, this, this is a free service and you make money from a third party. Not very different from what, how you, newspapers used to make money before or commercial television used to make money in the past. Let's briefly look at, at, uh, at Android system. 
here you have users, a user Android, and you have Android app developers. The model here is a little different, but in this particular case, it's the app developer who actually uh, gets access to the platform, to the users, but it has to pay uh, a commission to Google. Uh, so for in-app in uh, sales, for example, it's, it's currently uh, typically uh, a 30% uh, commission. And it's also, there's an entry fee to become a, a, a registered developer with, uh, with uh, Google, for example, and others like, uh, like uh, Apple. A lot of people complain about that fee and say this is an expropriation, right? But they overlook that actually the platform provides an enormous service to them because otherwise, if it weren't for the platform, they would not reach all those users, right? Uh, so one can, of course, debate that the 30% is a good value, it's too high, um, as some people legitimately claim. Uh, but the platform actually provides a service that is complementary to the app developer. The app developers need the platform uh, and otherwise their, their business model would be way more difficult. And so there's again, positive network effects uh, between those different user groups. And then finally, and this is perhaps uh, even more sort of uh, contested than, than this app development model, uh, the role of Google in news, right? often misunderstood. A lot of uh, news organization claim that, that that Google uses their news, which it does not actually. Google, Google makes news findable, right? Google organizes uh, our news and makes it uh, detectable, but it points users to news information. But in the transaction, Google actually appropriates a lot of the advertising revenue that otherwise might have accrued to the news agency, right? And that's the big issue, right? Google essentially free rides on content. It doesn't, doesn't take content from anybody, it just links to the content, but because it is able to link to content, it can take a large share uh, of, the, of, the, of the revenue. And that of course challenges, right? Uh, creative businesses enormously. And so we see that what I said before, generically, right? Platforms have positive effects on innovation. They have stimulated enormous innovation in apps, for example. They have uh, stimulated enormous efficiency improvements in, 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 in matching information seekers and information offers, uh, but they have also had some negative effects uh, that, that this ecosystem has on some of those players. Google, or more than others, in addition to those uh, network effects here, benefits from agglomeration effects across all these players. Right, so the fact that Google is present in so many different areas really gives it uh, additional advantages that many of the other players do not have. So there's a lot of market power that has to be watched very, very carefully. Now let's briefly talk about my last point, uh, and that is that we need guardrails, right? And this is this is actually this is not this is not invented. This is a true highway in Norway, right? And you can see very clearly that if you go in, you know, on a treacherous road like this, you need guardrails, which is sort of these sort of, uh, uh, you know, these rails at, that prevent you from falling off where you want to go, right? The digital economy needs the same thing. And um, let me just say a couple of downsides, right? I mean, despite all the excitement that we have about digital transformation and all the benefits that we've seen, all the innovative business models and the enormous opportunities for entrepreneurship and innovation, um, there's some questions that for which we don't have good answers. One is, if innovation is driven only by commercial motives, if all we want to have is create another unicorn, will the digital economy really generate the type of innovation we want as society? Will it create public interest innovation? For example, inclusive smart cities, services that, in, that uh, include uh, now marginalized populations, the answer is most likely not. Right? It will mostly create commercial innovation, which has some benefits, of course, but it, there will be a deficit of public interest innovations. Secondly, what are the implications of the digital economy for social justice? Right? I mean, we do know that, that uh, income inequality uh, is, is a big looming risk of the digital economy. And uh, there's two trends that work at, at, at cross, at collision course in a sense, right? It is true that the digital economy, because it has enabled new global value chain, for example, has reduced the, the gap in average income between 
uh, low and middle income countries and high income countries. So globally, average national incomes have converged and come closer to each other. At the same time, the digital economy has greatly increased inequality within nations. And it's not the same in all nations, depending on you know, tax laws and other kind of uh, government policies. Some have done better than others, but, but in many nations we see actually an increase in inequality. And if it, if it remains unfettered uh, and just based on a neoliberal market paradigm, then I think most likely inequality will further increase going forward. It also has sort of reduced the ability of workers. Uh, and this is maybe more of an issue in, 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 uh, in high income countries where bargaining power was important. Uh, it has, has reduced the ability to bargain and make a, a decent living, right? So there's, there's very weak protection and we see bouncing back here and, and pushback. The third point that I should mention is what's the, the impact of, of uh, digital transformation on the future of work, right? I mean, we see that worldwide middle skill jobs and middle income jobs are shrinking. So this, the pink is the middle paying jobs and you see that across a large number of countries in the last 10, 15 years, those middle income jobs have disappeared because they were auto, these tasks and jobs are automated away by technology. And we see that both high paying jobs, the black ones and low paying jobs, the green ones, which could be low levels of service. You know, some people speak about the high tech and the high touch economy, right? In the high touch economy, we cannot use uh, technology as well. We need individuals, uh, but frequently these are very, very poor jo paying jobs. Is that a desirable thing, right? We also have uh, broader social and political concerns, right? I mean, there's, a, there's digital industries are not clean industries. They extract a lot of natural resources. In fact, artificial intelligence, if you look at the value chains, it uses elements from three quarters of the periodic table of elements. So almost any kind of resource we have on the planet is used uh, in, in artificial intelligence. They also appropriate significant free labor without compensation, right? I mean, uh, data that we use uh, and so forth. Uh, do we want this? They also exhaust a large amount of toxic e-waste and techno trash. And uh, very often processed in, under very poor conditions in, in low income countries. Uh, there's um, a lot of fantasizing, uh, another one of those images about the green ICT, right? And its contribution to environmentally safe production. The reality is that, that in exponential growth patterns, the, material econ the growth in the material economy cannot be compensated by, by digital technology, right? I mean, we are currently on a crash course when it comes to environmental issues, and we don't have a really good uh, answer. The, the, the vision that we can have more for less is not completely wrong, but it's, it's, not, it's not true uh, uh, completely, right? I mean, uh, uh, so, so we have no solution to, to green ICT. It's, it's whitewashing essentially what companies do when they speak of green ICT. Uh, finally, privacy and surveillance, right? I mean, uh, very, very strong dilemmas that we haven't uh, overcome. So to harness the opportunities and minimize the risks, what do we need? We need good governance. And that's where my heart actually gets really disheartened because I, I've worked with government, governments uh, and, 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 and voluntary organizations, civil society for a long time. And I see how difficult it is to come up with good governance, right? I mean, uh, in the country I've lived in, the United States, for the past two decades, we have not had very effective federal government, for example. And many problems did not get addressed uh, as well as they could. Uh, but we would need, ideally, competition rules. We would need regulation that allows price differentiation uh, and, 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 uh, and these benefits, but at the same time establishes safeguards against anti-competitive um, discrimination. We need policies, of course, to create uh, access to infrastructure, which is still, as I said before, is just very unequal. We need inclusion. We need measures to enhance security and trust. And then we need to have a much more broad discussion on what are the important values we would like to protect, equality, inclusion, uh, freedom of expression, but what do we mean by freedom of expression? Should we put boundaries on, on hate speech, for example, um, privacy? How do we uh, create conditions that enable the capabilities of individuals? Now, one 
positive note that I have uh, in this in this critical reflection is that in the next probably decade or decades even, clearly the benefits of digital innovation is that that IoT chart showed you right. They will be way more uh, way stronger in 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 economies in countries that are sort of in the, in the middle part of the income pyramid. So a place like Indonesia has enormous opportunities uh, to take advantage of digital ecology. Now, if you manage to also address sort of some of those guardrails going forward, and I really appeal to you as, as individuals, right? Because it's not just government and civil society, it's also every individual developer, every designer, uh, every, every manager getting into that space has a responsibility to make sure we use the power of these technologies for the human good. And which takes me back to my two premises. And that is that I hope I have, I have, I have sketched at least uh, in, in that a little longer talk than I thought it would be, uh, the potential power of the digital economy, that this will not happen automatically, right? The benefits. Uh, and that we need uh, these guardrails. And what we really need is, and this is, that's why it's so great to speak to an audience of, 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 of students and graduate students. Um, what we need is two things, right? We need hard heads because thinking through those issues and understanding the digital economy is not easy. It requires a lot of sort of a very sort of sharp and analytical thinking, but we also need soft hearts, right? Because uh, soft hearts will give us the compassion and, 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 and the willingness to focus on those broader guardrails that we want to impose, uh, there's still plenty of innovation left to do, even with in strong guardrails, let me put it this way. And so thank you for your attention. And now we can use the rest of the time for, for Q&A, okay. if there are any. Yeah, thank you so much, Johannes. I mean, it's, it's, I know it's very dense, full of concept, but it's very insightful. Yeah, even I learned more about digital economy, even though I took your course few years ago, back then few years ago. <laughs> I mean, you, I mean, it's interesting because initially you constantly redefine what is digital economy. You use the term digitally enabled economy, and also you outline uh, the ecosystem of digital economy through diverse layers to understand the complexity of digital economy and also you explain the business model the working business model to some extent uh multi-site markets uh three or four just like in google and toward the end you propose uh guardrails to ensure equal distribution to improve people's economic being like you said uh, not just head but also the heart so that's basically a uh, if I can summarize your talk for today's talk. So before I give a chance for audience, uh, I received a few messages because your talk is timely. Uh, back then earlier this week, Gojek and Tokopedia, two biggest unicorn in Indonesia, is uh, merging. So officially they are become partner right now. So uh, the public, uh, very excited, but to some extent it's worrisome because you are already outlined. I mean, with the merger, it's it's cost efficient. Like right now for me, if I order uh, goods or I buy something from Tokopedia, I can get discount 2000 rupiah. It's basically 50 to 60% discount for delivery using Gojek. But uh, you mentioned about the winner takes all in platform economy because uh, with the merger, it will kill competition, maybe, probably, and opportunities. Uh, let's say Gojek and Tokopedia can can limit uh, competitors because they are so huge in Indonesia and they can absorb uh, financial loss in the short term to get benefit in the longer term. Uh, let's say a company like Grab or other uh, delivery services will not compete with Gojek. Right now, if someone ordered through uh, Tokopedia, uh, I would ask, what do you think about should government intervene just to keep uh, fair competition in the market? Because consolidating power between Gojek and Wikipedia, integrating market horizontally, so it it 
it in the long terms uh, i'm afraid that they will uh, create a unfair monopoly uh, by merging the market and consolidate dating power and financial so what do you think johannes yeah, this this is a very very uh very interesting question and it's a question that uh, many many other countries also face and so I think what you what you hopefully saw in, in my in my in my presentation is is this idea that um, that it's not surprising right that those big companies uh, consolidate further because because they can utilize additional efficiencies uh, and so the the economic forces in in these digital markets are clearly in favor of, of more more concentration larger enterprises and that it's really a, a difficult bargain on the one hand you get efficiency gains uh, so you can produce your services at lower cost it's which is something that benefits everybody but as you as you pointed out correctly right it's possible that then now competitors are, are being uh, left out of the market and the question is how should government respond right i mean and there's no all depends specifically on the market situation, right? I know, I must say openly, I know too little about the competitive landscape to give you sort of an uh, off the cuff analysis, but here are the things that one would have to look at, but right? one is, does the merger already uh, sort of uh, raise so many concerns that it would be best, better for society not to approve the merger? So in, 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 uh, in, uh, in the US, for example, where there's a very strong merger review process, uh, one, one would analyze what are the potential consequences for the future of the market. My hunch is that, uh, that uh, given uh, that Indonesia is, is it, the digital economy is growing very, very fast, but right? maybe those concerns uh, are not strong enough to sort of prevent the merger to begin with, right? which seems to be uh, the case. Uh, but it, it would be useful to think about maybe safeguards to, to to protect competitors, right? And, and so, so for example, merger agreements often are protected or sort of a, a, a sort of augmented with some non-discrimination obligations. So for example, um, while it's, it's, it's probably uh, acceptable uh, that there is sort of some kind of price differentiation between different partners in that larger ecosystem, one probably wants to have safeguards uh, that will avoid uh, the, the combined company now from imposing additional costs and fees on their competitors that price them out of the market, right? And you know, I, I know too little of the specific details to to uh, you know, give more specific uh, instructions, but that's something that that uh, that a regulator or government uh, should do. It's one of the challenges is that the that we also frequently don't have the right institutions in place to address those issues. So in, in um, uh, traditional communications regulatory agencies often don't have the power to address those things. And then traditional competition authorities frequently have only limited tools. And I have, I have frequently argued like as have others uh, for a framework where we establish those guardrails that I talked about, principles that should apply right, for fair competition and then give maybe a new agency or existing agencies the, the right tools to intervene very quickly in correct actions, right? I mean, so typical lawsuits and, and competition processes are way too slow to respond in that fast paced digital economy, but safeguards definitely would be desirable. I, my, my, my forecast is that this will not be the last merger that you see in the digital economy in, 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 in the ASEAN region or in Indonesia. Thank you, Johannes. Uh, there are one following question still uh, regarding uh, Gojek and Tokopedia merger. Uh, the problem you already laid out in your presentation that platform economy it's it's more likely to to reduce middle class because it's more like for uh, upper economic class and lower. So it's so the question is. Uh, this is the case in Indonesia. Uh, Gojek and Tokopedia prefers to keep their driver as partner, not worker, since they don't have to pay minimum wage as regulated by the government. This way, drivers will never be financially stable because they don't have any say in company influence or and also they don't have a social net, something like retiree plan. 
health benefit kind of thing. So yeah, that's that's the following question. What what do you think? How the government should regulate this industry? Yeah, so it's it's a really interesting question. I mean, I should actually. Um, I'll, I'll put I'll put um, um, maybe, maybe maybe as we as we <laughs> when you when you post the next question I have, I, I wrote okay. a, a study actually a paper on on those okay. issues and so the that was published last year on on, on on what workers would want and but let me first talk about the generic issue right mm -hmm. so so there's what you see here in 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 uh, in these companies and like Grab and Gojek and, and uh, Lyft and Uber and so forth, mm -hmm. is sort of a, is a, is is this sort of combination of positive and negative effects, and it's very difficult mm -hmm. sometimes to assess what's the overall net effect, right? And mm -hmm. so, what are some of the the positive effects? Well, some of the positive effects are that that uh, that these companies created very innovative. Uh, business models to coordinate uh, people who need transportation and people who, uh, who, who are able to offer transportation, right? And, and uh, the, the coordination problem is actually very difficult. Those of us who are old enough to, or had, had to use traditional taxi service, you know how frustrating it could be to wait for very, very long periods of time uh, to get a, a, a cab uh, uh, in a place where you need it. Uh, clearly, there's efficiency gains that were achieved, and sort of the reputation mechanisms, the feedback loops, and so forth, the, the mobile payment processing, and so forth. These are all benefits that are that are that need to be recognized. And uh, uh, in many places that I know, right, I mean the, the quality of, of of the taxi cab vehicles and so forth mm -hmm. improved, the cleanliness and so mm -hmm. forth. And so there's 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 benefits. Uh, at the same time. You know, one one uh, big thing on in, in innovation that I didn't mention uh, explicitly is Joseph Schumpeter, who said, who talked about the innovation as creative destruction. At the same time, right, there is existing uh, uh, taxi companies uh, and transportation companies. Sometimes they their business com com conditions are given by government regulations that they need to follow. And, uh, and uh, their, their business model is uh, all of a sudden becoming unsustainable. And, uh, and so disruption here also has negative consequences on the existing players. And so you, you may have job losses, uh, you may have uh, bankruptcies in, in traditional companies as, as you, know, you see in many countries. And the question is, what do we want to do? I think the market in and of itself will not solve those issues, right? I mean, so, so this, is this is one of those problems where we need to have clear understanding of what what kind of minimal uh, protections do we want for employees or for workers. And just to use a legal uh, argument to say these are sort of uh, independent contractors as, as this is many countries, but it's not, it's not, it's just evading uh, the, the intention, right? And so that's mm -hmm. what I meant with those guardrails. So we, um, uh, now interestingly, so, so one option would be to, to as, as has been the case now in an increasing number of places to say, you cannot treat uh, these workers without sort of minimal protections, right? And then the question is this, is your innovation still financially sustainable if you obey certain minimum protections for workers that we agree as a society we want to, to have and, 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 and retain? And uh, if, if the innovation is not, is not good enough to survive under those conditions, well, maybe the innovation was not as great, right? Maybe it was only innovation that was only disrupting and uh, using uh, uh, regulatory uh, inefficiencies. Um, my, my hunch is that, that these companies will adapt. The work that I'm, uh, I may share with you in case somebody's interested in it, mm -hmm. we actually re we interviewed quite a number of drivers. Uh, and, and what we found actually is that, that managers of these um, transportation companies would actually be better off if they offered better social safety plans uh, to their consumers because they would overcome sort of some of their management challenges by offering a menu of choices at least. But that's just as a, as a side remark. Okay. Okay, thank you, Johannes. Okay, uh, another question from Maida Zakia. Uh, so Maida asks about, can you explain me about innovation NFT? It's a kind of blockchain. Oh, yeah, uh, so NFT, the, the, 
the the arts market that I talked about. Yeah. 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 So a non fungible token is essentially mm -hmm. is is a is a is an encrypted token that you that you own that certifies mm -hmm. that you own a piece of art, right? And in, in, in mm -hmm. this in the digital art place currently, mm -hmm. sort of one of the really promising ideas is mm -hmm. that artists create unique certified um, items. Mm -hmm. And so there's only one copy, right? One one original copy. And, and the ownership in that in that copy is 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 certified with that non-fungible token. And so so those tokens, they're tradable, right? You can give them away as a gift. <laughs> You can you can uh, you can uh, sell them, you can uh, split them, you can auction them off, and so forth. And so it's a, it's 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 literally like a like a certificate of ownership. But in, uh, I'm not sure how you in like how you treat cars. So in the U.S., you get a um, you get a certificate that you are the owner of the car, right? It has a specific uh, number that is registered in public records. This is. This is a blockchain-based solution. So there is a there is a very safe, decentralized record as to who owns a piece of art. And the NFT is simply the the, the, the digital certificate that shows you this. And then so so let's say an artist who who uh, creates a digital painting, for example, uh, uh, or a hologram or whatever it might be, right? Obtains obtains uh, a, a, a such a fungible token, and then that that can be sold on the, on the auction market. Okay. Okay, thank you, Jonas. Uh, another question, uh, Professor Bauer, in your opinion, this is from Sweeney Aristika. Is there any successful business model that influenced by the development of digital economy for nonprofit or development sector? Yeah, yeah, so that's, that's a really good question. So thank you, thank you for this one. Um, and so there's, there's enormous, Opportunities for 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 nonprofit enterprises, right, uh, in that space, and um, and in fact, historically, right, I mean, there's there's many large parts of the digital economy did not work on a for-profit basis, and I'm I'm not sure whether you covered in 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 your course, uh, let's say the work by by uh, Yokai Benkler at Harvard University, um, the the value of of networks, for example. Where, where he strongly emphasizes the peer-to-peer -peer economy. And so this was 15, 20 years ago. Many of us thought that the peer-to-peer -peer economy would become the dominant part of the digital economy. And that is where people voluntarily uh, contribute. There's large communities that still work like this. So for example, if you're uh, a Linux developer, the Linux operating system is maintained by a peer-to-peer -peer community. Uh, the 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 GitHub repository before it was purchased uh, and taken over by Microsoft, essentially was it was a, a such a peer to peer community. It was not based on a profit model, and um, and so in those cases, right? How 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 do you sustain this business as well? Uh, you use the same model that uh, that I showed you that sort of three way model that Google uses for search, uh, just modified for the circumstances. So, for example, uh, programmers who who post to um, let's say Stack Overflow, another example. Right? Uh, they do it voluntarily. They help other programmers to, to answer questions. And um, th the benefits that they, they get from it are intangible. They develop a reputation. Uh, Stack Overflow has a job market associated with it, right? I mean, people who answer their questions better uh, get a higher reputation. So there's ways to do this. But you, you, your question might have been, let's say, what, what about charities, right? And, and here there's other examples uh, that one could refer to. And, and that is, for example, I had a student from Pakistan uh, uh, a year ago who, um, and, and Pakistan is, is also a Muslim, Muslim country. So he was interested in how to help people um, uh, meet their uh, giving obligations uh, in different ways. And they created a digital platform that enabled uh, individuals actually to, to uh, make charitable contribution on the platform to, to a, a charity of their choice, right? And so they greatly improved actually the working of these, these nonprofit transactions, helping all the organizations. And then finally, if you just think about, let's say a, a, a one, one particular group, right? One model 
that works frequently is that digital technology enables you to, let's say you're a neighborhood group, you want to work with a, a marginalized groups in a neighborhood. Uh, digital technology enables you to, to raise donations in a much more effective way from a lot, much larger uh, group of people. So there's multiple ways, right? The, you, you create an, a revenue stream from an, uh, a third party market. You have uh, donations that you can collect digitally uh, or, or um, grants uh, that you can fund and so forth. Okay, thank you, Johannes. Uh, yeah, Mbak dan Mas, kalau ada mau bertanya silakan. Yeah, uh, silakan Mbak Ratna Komala, silakan unmute. So this is from audience, Johannes. Mbak Ratna, silakan unmute. Okay. Thank you, Mas Wisnu. Uh, good evening, uh, Professor Johannes. Um, as you mentioned that digital technology creates enormous opportunities in business models and eventually uh, create or brings digital economic growth. But there's always uh, two uh, contradictory sides in one coin. On the other, on, uh, on the other hand, as the consequences, uh, the winner uh, takes all and the rest gets nothing. And another challenge, uh, we face uh, privacy and surveillance problems, create increasing dilemmas with uh, considerable variation across countries and regions. So um, do you think that um, regulation is um, uh, the, the only way to, to solve this problem uh, as uh, earlier discussion we have. And uh, can, you, can you share uh, some lesson learned from, for Indonesia, uh, the, the case in United States? Thank you. Yeah, well, thank you for the, for the questions. <laughs> this probably answering this question could, uh, uh, these questions could keep us busy for another two hours here. <laughs> so I have to be really short. Uh, and, uh, but they are very, very important questions. I'm, and I thank you for raising them, right? Uh, um, so terms like the winner take all, winner takes all uh, term, right? They are, again, they're a little bit, part of it is metaphoric, right? I mean, they're not necessarily completely true, but, but they're true in as, in as far uh, as that, that the large winner, uh, uh, winners frequently take a very large share of the market. Now, the good thing that works against, uh, against this is that the digital economy also has fast paced technological change. So it could be that that who looks like a winner in, in one decade, it disappears in the next, right? I mean, if you think about social media, for example, um, you had you had in the, in the US, for example, MySpace was much, much larger than Facebook uh, initially. And then Facebook had a different business idea. Facebook developed that platform ecosystem much better than, than uh, than MySpace and, and eventually took over. Uh, MySpace still exists and has you know, millions and millions of users, but it's less visible. Um, so w one, one safeguard against this winner take all phenomenon is, is, is the following, right? It, it's not necessarily bad for a to have a large company as long as that large company does not abuse its market power, right? So, so I think one, one safeguard has to be, let's make sure that large companies compete fairly. Uh, in the US currently, we have a huge discussion about breaking up Google and breaking up Facebook and most likely or breaking up Amazon into smaller companies. Most likely that is not a workable solution because of those enormous technological and economic forces, right? They will sooner or later recombine. Uh, in, into large kilometers. What would be more effective is to force them to not discriminate against their competitors, to create sort of open platforms that allow that whole ecosystem of complementary uh, business, businesses to interact with them without being discriminated against and, and without being manipulated against. And that is, in the end, that is probably a regulatory task. And, um, and my, my, as I said, I'm, I'm sort of somewhat disheartened in this part because uh, 
worldwide, we have we have not seen sort of very very uh, successful um, interventions in such complicated problems. Although we're learning, right? I mean, we're only at the very beginning, so to make mistakes is probably to be expected. Uh, but uh, but sort of regulatory solutions probably would be good. And uh, the, the same, you know, the same similar situation applies to this question of surveillance and uh, and uh, and privacy. And frequently, you be, you have heard probably about the privacy paradox, and and which is in my way misle It's one of those misleading terms again, because the privacy paradox says well people talk about privacy, individuals, but then when you off when you ask them give them a, a one rupee or a ten rupee discount. Uh, or one dollar discount at the at the checkout of a supermarket. They give you their email address voluntarily, right? It's it's a, a very cheap price. Now the, the challenge though is that this is actually mis, a misstated problem. I think it's it's a privacy dilemma, because in many many cases we cannot but divulge our private identity or information. Right? I mean, so we, we have no choice. We exclude it from lots of services if we don't do so. So I think uh, talking about privacy. Paradox is, is 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 very misleading in my view, and how do we how do we safeguard privacy? Well, there's I didn't have a chance to talk about this. There's multiple solutions. Again, one would be um, laws and regulations, right? And, and if you look at the European development, for example, the the GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation, it's one effort to to create stronger rights for individual participants in the digital ecosystem. And in other words, it strengthens the position of individuals. For example, you, you have rights to, to have uh, wrong information uh, to be removed. You have a right to inspect your information. You have a right to withdraw the permission to, to share your, your private data. Uh, we will also see probably increasingly market-based solutions. And maybe this is something would be of interest for Indonesia uh, too. And that is that there will be new intermediaries who who, act, who are between an individual user and the digital uh, company, let's say an e-commerce company, and they will provide an interface to the user to manage uh, information in a much clearer and simpler way than we currently can do it uh, on, on most social media. So it's legal devices, it's 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 market devices, um, and and uh, they can help. The, the problem of surveillance. I think I, I just let me just say very briefly. In in the question of surveillance, who the good actors and the bad actors are is not always clear, right? So, so of course in in the U.S. the discussion was was uh, uh, introduced and was really uh, amplified by the revelations of Edward Snowden, who showed that it's actually government who was the biggest surveilling agent in many ways, right? But we were as concerned by, by surveillance by private companies. And um, my, my own position is this, we need, to, we need to find as a society, what kind of uh, actions do we think are not desirable, right? I mean, what kind of data collection efforts are not desirable? And the, it, is, it is feasible and I think in Indonesia, because you are sort of maybe early in that stage, you could you could uh, have a serious discussion on it. Should we prohibit the collection of certain types of data? Uh, that was a big issue. For example, you have heard about Sidewalk Labs, which is a um, uh, the big uh, development project of uh, of Google or its parent company, Alphabet, in Toronto. They wanted to build a smart city with had enormous innovation capabilities. But the problem that they could not solve is they could not solve uh, the issue uh, that, that they could not commit their, their participating businesses to not collect certain data. And in the end, uh, the, the provincial government, the city government uh, of Toronto were, and the citizens were so concerned that they, they, they folded the project after many, many years of, of development. Right? But it's legitimate to not collect certain types of data. Not all innovation is good innovation. <laughs> so, so, so we want to channel innovation in directions that as a society we'd like, right? And if we, if you think certain types of data should not be collected, then we channel innovation in directions that does not need this type of data. There's still plenty of innovation opportunities and benefits for society. 
I just uh, um, saw a last point, and and this ties in into this right about about um, uh, the national digital literacy program. Digital literacy is a very very important uh, issue, right? I mean, so and it's it's part of that whole equation of how to address privacy and, and surveillance issues is to increase digital literacy uh, so that individual users are, are capable to, to manage some of those issues. We see the same thing, by the way, in the security issue, right? I mean, we, we have data. Bill Dutton, who spoke to you a while ago, uh, he, he's part of a project where they look at, um, at different nations and there's very clear evidence that if you have uh, more capacity and more digital literacy uh, that security incidents and security vulnerabilities decrease actually so the trust in the in the digital ecosystem increases with digital literacy and digital capability bagaimana maratna Yes, I think it's a long, long answer to, and we need more discussion. Maybe uh, we need to uh, discuss for one uh, another session, <laughs> especially about this this topic. Uh, but thank you very much for for the answer. And uh, yeah, it's 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 really hard to 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 get the the what you call it the result the final result i think for the answer yeah the challenge is uh the challenge is um that i think you know we we are in the process of learning this is we, we have to nobody has the exact answer to those questions yet right i mean and so what we see is is actually experiments i think that maybe the best thing uh that could be done is to to um monitor what's happening in other places right so for example in the us currently this is in some sense undesirable we have we have different the fragmentation of of laws right i mean so california uh, virginia several of the 50 states have Im imposed different types of regulations and there is a downside to this right in in, in that that uh it it fragments more or less the opportunity uh, for these digital companies to offer services across larger spaces. And uh, it, it undermines sort of some of the potential benefits. At the same time, it's the only way how we can learn how what, what works and what doesn't work, right? And so I think we, we need to admit that we don't have complete answers to those issues, but we need, to, we need to have active discussions on it and make sure that where we do know uh, that um, that there is concerns that will will impose the right types of regulations uh, to to guide those those entrepreneurs in the right direction. Right, and I think for Indonesia, is uh, regulation is a crucial crucial and critical problems to to uh, to handle to protect the the people and everybody. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So I, I, my own, my own view is in most, in most situations, right? It's probably a combination of, of public regulation, government regulation, uh, combined with sort of uh, tools that technology uh, uh, can offer. So it's uh, what, what we, what we talk about is sort of a multi-layer, polycentric, and that sounds very technical regulation. But there's multiple tools that we use that complement, and and uh, assist each other. Right. Right, thank you. Thank you very much, Professor. You're welcome. Okay, Johannes, we have one last question. I mean, I mean it's almost two hours. It's it's more than, than yeah, yeah, when I, I I'm talk sorry the for first time. So late. I mean there must be I'm sure that's that's your no, favorite. No, no, we don't want to disturb your show. time. Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay, Mbak Nia. Silakan. Hi. Uh, Good morning, I guess, for your side. Yes, um, hi. Yes, um, actually, I think you've answered the question that I had, uh, which was, you know, what, what is would be the success factors for a country with various info issues and uh, access in regards to this launch of the National D Digital Literacy Program? Yeah, so, so first of all, let me just re-emphasize how important it is to, to uh, think about digital literacy. And, and digital literacy includes 
a lot of things, right? And so from, in my view, it would be important to, that I don't know the details of this, this program and I'd be happy to learn more about it, is, is to, for one, think about digital literacy is a problem that really is, starts in at very early age, but then reaches all the way to, to, uh, uh, to old age. And uh, most of our education systems worldwide only focus on early age. And so, so in the US, we, we have like the K through kindergarten through 12th grade system and then the university system. And uh, there is now an increasing discussion about uh, K through 60 education is the shortcut here. So, so kindergarten through 60 and, and, and more. And I think it, it will be important to, to make sure that, that, uh, that there is sort of an opportunity for continuing education. So that digital literacy is not just something that young people learn, but that, that, that one finds ways to, uh, to do continuing education or, or, or educate uh, groups in the workforce and uh, groups who are not in the workforce. On, on, on the use of, uh, of technology. And so coming back to the previous question, right? I mean, that would be also a con one contribution to, to addressing issues such as um, privacy and surveillance and so forth. Thank you. I, I, I don't really know yet what is the content of the launching of the National Digital Literacy Program tomorrow, but well, maybe I can provide you some input later on when, when I find out. Yeah. I'd be most interested, in, and it's uh, it's something that I'm I'm deeply interested in. That is, uh, I'm part of a what is called the National Digital Inclusion Alliance uh, in the United States, and it's uh, that was was really um, empowered by, in a sense, sounds a little bit uh, paradoxical, but the the COVID crisis right really highlighted, like like in many other places, how important connectivity is and what the limitations are. And as a result, many local groups emerged that, that, that have very sort of good knowledge of local conditions and that help uh, uh, train uh, individuals. And there's many, many very innovative programs. So, so I'd be interested to hear more about, about uh, the initiative in Indonesia too. Yes, we'll connect somehow. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Hi, Johannes, would you mind to take another one? This is the no, real no, I'm, 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 I'm not time constrained. So this is, okay. this is my, first, my last event uh, before I go into the summer break. So. Okay. okay, thank you. Okay, Mbak Agnia, Nadia. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, hi, Dr. Bauer. Uh, hey. Thank you, Mas Wisnu, for the opportunity. Actually, I put my question on the chat box. But anyway, uh, we've been talking about how, how digital economy can contribute to social justice or how it can truly uh, serve uh, the humanity. And I just, I just want to know, in the long run, do you see that blockchain technology or cryptocurrency and uh, so on as a part of digitally enabled economy can truly serve humanity since uh, they promise uh, data decentralization, transparency, and more democratic uh, dynamics in economy? What do you think, Dr. Bauer? Thank you. Yeah, it's a, it's a very good question. And I, uh, definitely tremendous opportunities. I, I'm, I'm sort of more on the skeptical side when it comes to the question of is this uh, the breakthrough technology that will solve a lot of uh, issues that we are currently facing. It's probably, again, one contribution. And um, it, what it does address are questions of, of trust and, and, uh, in, in the digital economy. Trust is, is extremely important. And uh, we have seen in the last decades almost worldwide, uh, a decline um, in trust. And you know, the speed has, has varied and, uh, depending on, on the country and, and there's, there's the strong national and regional differences. Uh, but in general, uh, trust in, in many institutions has, has, has decreased at least slightly, right? And, and so the digital economy, on the other hand, requires trust. And it's, the argument is, is in a simplified way is, is is the following, right? We engage often with partners, uh, business partners or, or customers or clients whom we've never met, whom we don't know. And so, so in order to interact with them, right? Trust is important. Typically trust is generated by repeated interactions in, in, among, among individuals. And so, so what we see is the, the 
migration of, of trust generating institutions to online environments, right? We see, we see, um, we see it already in, in, in uh, services such as the, the mobile transportation, the transport, local transportation services with reputation mechanisms and so forth, which is sort of limited forms of trust building. And blockchain has the potential to really uh, sort of create a, a distrustworthy uh, environment for transactions online. So in that sense, it will be, will be um, very fundamental. The one thing we don't know is, is, is there's probably sort of a, a challenge related to uh, the, the uh, computing resources needed to manage large uh, scale transactions on, on blockchain. And uh, there's, there's also challenges now with, with uh, cryptocurrencies, for example, currently in that, that their value is driven by a lot of factors that are not related to the transactions that are, that are being made. And that's potentially a factor that undermines trust again. So, so my answer is, is, a, is a provisional yes. I think it's a, it's, a, it's a fantastic technology. It's a fantastic opportunity. There's many places in the world, you know, where sort of a, the quality of information that's available for who, who owns land, who owns certain types of assets and so forth, for example, is, is, is very poor and very intransparent. And so blockchain really can help us, uh, can help make major leaps forward there. And it can really help sort of a, uh, create a, a layer of trust in that in that sort of a world of digital transactions that that uh, can help overcome some of the challenges of, of really uh, and uh, and and uh, help utilize the benefits of digital technology. So okay. thank you for the question. Thank you, Dr. Bauer. Uh, I surely myself need to learn more about this concept, but thank you for your perspective. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mas Wisno. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Johannes. So uh, finally, uh, we end the lecture and the QA. Thank you very much, Johannes, for your time. I mean, we learned a lot from you. I mean, digital technology is promising, but to some extent, we should create some kind of guardrails. It could be from the government. It could be from uh, civil society. I mean, it's 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 I don't know. It's different mechanism to to move forward toward digital economy that can create equal uh, distribution, economic distribution for the people. Okay, thank you so much again, Johanna, uh, for audience. Uh, can we give applause to Professor Bauer? Yay. Thank, okay. you. thank, thank you, thank you very you. much. Thank you, thank you, Danke. I would like to invite Everyone. all the audience to um, perhaps uh, turn on their video and say hi to Prof. Johannes Bauer. And thank you, Prof. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. 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 Thank Thank you. 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 So we officially finished the uh, lecture for today. Uh, have a good uh, day. Have a good evening, everyone. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you so much, Henry. Thank you, 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 Thank you, Henry. Thank you, Thank you, Henry. Thank you, Thank you, Thank you, Thank you, Thank you, Okay, I'm going to end the meeting for all. Thank you.